some of these? Well, um, while we recommend that everyone um, complete a health care directive and a um, durable power of attorney for health care, and for most, of, most people who do that, that serves the purpose. But mm -hmm. um, especially in a case of a head injury or dementia or even a mental illness, um, might even be an onset of mental illness for the first time during old age, um, a person can become non-cooperative and combative and revoke, remember we talked yes. earlier, that that's revocable. So then there is no more power, there's no mm -hmm. one to make a decision if that happens. Mm -hmm. Now, in a conservatorship, there's a court appointment of a person called a conservator who then would make decision for the principal you yes. know, that we talked about, and in this case, be called a conservatee. And the court would um, issue what we call letters, yes. and that would be the official um, documentation to show that you have this power to make decisions. But if the conservatee, again, we're talking about this combative movie, yes. conservatee, is saying, no, you know, I don't want that treatment, then there's a special order that the court can issue, um, which, not to get into too much detail, but which confers what we call exclusive authority to make medical decisions. And what that really means is that the conservator then has the ability to consent to treatment over the objections of the conservatee. Mm -hmm. So, you know, your first layer, of course, is to try to get um, uh, cooperation and consent from the conservatee. But if it's really essential to do and they won't give that consent, then this would allow you to override it. Uh, the probate code does require that the conservator make every effort to honor the wishes of the conservatee. In fact, they're forbidden for, uh, from ignoring those wishes unless it breaches their duty or causes harm to the conservatee. So, it's kind of a job, and then mm -hmm. you know there are some problems with getting a doctor to agree to, you know, give someone surgery or treatment um, that they are actively physically objecting to at the time of the treatment. Fortunately, most of the time that's not the case. Most of the time they're just generally objecting and saying no, but they physically go along with the direction of the conservator. Mm -hmm. Um, a mm -hmm. living trust is a financial document in California, at least. Uh, it doesn't usually have health care uh, instructions, although I have seen some living trusts have health care uh, instructions. Um, but there is a document called the living will, which is, you know, people use that terminology a lot. It's not actually a, a legal document in California necessarily, but I think it's useful even if it doesn't comply with the code requirements, it's useful in giving this instruction that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I've even had people write, you know, in their own hand a letter mm -hmm. to put in the file or keep at home, telling about all of their different religious and philosophies and physical fears and that sort of thing. Right. And that would be somewhat of a living will. Right. And the living trust is important as far as creating a mechanism for paying your medical bills and things like oh, that. It's yeah. essential, yeah. yes. I mean, it's not typically a document that's uh, suitable for making health care decisions, yeah. but it's a very essential document in terms of putting in place that person who will make your decisions if you become incapacitated about your finances and your property management. Yeah. So I, I think it's very important. Okay. And, uh, and I think worth noting is that a will doesn't do that. Yes. The effect of a will yeah. is only when you die. Right. There's no interim provision in a will. Right. So there are other alternatives, but it's probably beyond the scope of our right. uh, discussion here. And so I guess I'll leave it at that. But folks, uh, that's why though it's, it's part of an entire uh, package. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, your estate plan go goes beyond being just an estate plan. Right. It's really about... Uh, part of your long-term financial planning and your personal care planning and all these things that are sort of wrapped into that process. So, um, so you, don't, you have to sort of take your, the, uh, uh, the old thing for the groove, you know, for the playing the old records. That most people don't even know what I'm talking about anymore, but we've, <laughs> we've got to skip true. to the next track on the CD, folks, and, uh, yeah. and uh, be aware that uh, it needs to be a more comprehensive than just uh, thinking about what's going to happen after you're gone. Okay, 
So let's move on to the next issue then. Uh, when do you favor in-home care and what are other alternatives when your health is declining? Well, I, I would f favor in-home care and it's a practical thing when, first of all, the person wants to stay home and knows they're there. I mean, mm -hmm. they're getting enjoyment out of being yeah. in a home, in their home or in a home environment, and they have the financial means or uh, adequate assistance from family members to keep them safe. Mm -hmm. So if they need 24-hour care, uh, one shouldn't try to stay home if they need 24-hour care and it can't be provided because that can lead to a lot of uh, falls or accidents on the stove and that sort of thing. Um, if they can't stay at home, then mm -hmm. They, there are a number of uh, types of facilities. We're very fortunate in this area to have a whole array mm -hmm. of facilities of different levels and, and features uh, from a board and care home, which is someone's home, really, yeah. basically. They're licensed to provide care to up to s usually six people, although there are larger ones. And um, it's like a home environment. They're not many activities, but some people prefer that um, small, more private environment. And then there's some larger facilities and they can go from kind of larger to very large. Um, they provide uh, a lot of independent apartments um, mm -hmm. within the, the grounds, the larger ones do. And then as the person ages or becomes incapacitated, uh, what I call patch services that sometimes they have uh, providers right on the grounds that you can pay by the hour to come in and maybe help you bathe or get dressed or provide medicine um, mm -hmm. monitoring. And then uh, there's assisted living where you'd actually move into a unit maybe on those same grounds or a separate facility where your everyday needs are met, you, you know, the supervisor, somebody always available there. And some of those have dementia facilities on the grounds. Some are standalone dementia facilities. And some um, have nursing homes on the grounds. Mm -hmm. And then some nursing homes, of course, are standalone mm -hmm. facilities. Um, so, you know, some people like to move into a, a environment that has all the way from the uh, independent living all the way up to the skilled nursing facility right on the same grounds. Mm -hmm. And some of these are places that you can buy into mm -hmm. uh, and others are ones more typically that you would pay a monthly fee and would cover your room and board and care. Right. Yeah. So I think I'll just throw in a couple of little things related to this. One is I, I had a situation with one of my clients. Let's just say that you, they had money in the family. but. You know, they're saying, well, we've got this estate planning problem. And I said, well, it looks like it's being taken care of because to keep her at home, they're basically consuming the estate. Yes, so, yeah, yeah, uh, you don't have an estate planning problem then. <laughs> yeah. So um, it, it can be very expensive. And so it may be good to think of alternatives. Also, we were surprised and we were fortunate, first of all, uh, with my father-in-law. I mentioned he had Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. He made the decision he said, basically, uh, well, first of all, we thought, you know, he wanted to stay home. He stayed home really for quite a, a long time. But finally, he got into a situation. He, he got scared himself. And so uh, had my wife take him to see some places. And one of them, he, sa he says, OK, when can I want to move in today. I'm ready. Mm. Let's, I'll move in now. And I'll tell you, that made life so much easier for us that he made that decision and it was affordable. He had the means for paying for it. And safer for him. And, and, then, for and him. then he has the activities and people it around him. It was great. Him. It was yeah. a place that they had a lot of activities. Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so it's great to have these choices and to be aware. And uh, you can get recommendations uh, from if you have a dementia a doctor, a mm -hmm. neurologist or whatever that you're working with, sometimes they can give you suggestions and there are other uh, resources. Uh, so mm -hmm. anyway, uh, let me get into the next question. What role does Medicare play and how do you qualify for coverage? Well, most people when they reach age 65 are qualified for Medicare. Um, some people are qualified earlier than that if they are disabled. I'm sorry, I, I, thought I was talking about Medi-Cal. Medi-Cal, oh, okay. 
Okay, um, let's Medi get into Medi-Cal. Yeah. Yeah. Medi-Cal is the only program that covers long-term care, meaning skilled mm -hmm. nursing care, um, f uh, over the long-term uh, custodial care. The Medicare it covers the skilled nursing facility, be the same facility, but it's for acute mm -hmm. temporary care right out of the hospital. Right. Um, so it's like insurance, mm -hmm. uh, health insurance. Long-term care uh, would be long-term care insurance or private um, pay or Medi-Cal. And the Medi-Cal eligibility, everyone thinks you have to be impoverished. And I mean, essentially that's their fundamental requirement, but uh, there are so many exemptions and things that can be done. In particular, if there's a married couple, there are a lot more opportunities to shelter assets so that Medicare, uh, Medi-Cal can be used to provide skilled nursing care. Mm -hmm. Now, that is um, what we call a higher level of care than the assisted living that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. In the state of California, Medi-Cal pays for the skilled nursing, but not for the assisted living, okay. which is a shame because yeah. um, ha you know some people economically have to go to the skilled nursing level because they don't have enough money to pay for the assisted living. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, if you get Medi-Cal benefits, do they have to be repaid? Um, Medi-Cal has the right to what we call recover. Mm -hmm. the uh, money that they've paid if the person that they provide the services um, to leaves an estate when they die. Um, again, there are some planning tools. For example, if they leave a spouse living and that spouse inherits that property, then the recovery is um, it, it's suspended, it's not waived. It's suspended until the, per the spouse dies. Mm -hmm. um, if they leave their assets uh, to their children and one of the children is totally disabled, then there's no recovery at all. It's an exemption from recovery. There are other Medi-Cal planning things that can be done to uh, overcome the recovery. Uh, I think you've had or will yeah. have some Medi-Cal yeah. programs yeah. and that has a more, probably yeah. more in-depth explanation. Yeah. Yeah. So I just want to hit some highlights. So right, I appreciate of course. Your comments. Mm -hmm. but yeah, so Folks, Medi-Cal is a big topic, and, and right. uh, I'll probably be doing another interview in the near future where we'll just talk about Medi-Cal itself. So, uh, Betty, we just have a few minutes left. Um, maybe you can share maybe some thoughts or, uh, you know, maybe an example or, or something uh, in this area of caring for incapacitated uh, friends or relations. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think one of the big examples is that uh, people don't seek out alternatives. I mean, we'll get somebody to come in to our office and they want to keep mom or dad at home and they assume that that's the only thing they can do. Like you point out, that can be much more expensive than a facility. And um, so they, they need to explore what other possibilities there are, either through an attorney's office or they could call the Council on Aging. Every Every county has a Council on Aging. You if you go online, then you can look up um, the State Department of Healthcare Services has a link to the Council on Aging in each county or phone number to call. And they can make referrals to a whole variety of services that are available to that person, um, including uh, private pay agencies, uh, daycare agencies, uh, services. Now those have been cut at the Medi-Cal level, but there's some that you could pay for. Mm -hmm. And um, in-home support services, again, Medi-Cal eligibility, but there's some hours that might be available. And there's some programs that provide a whole array of services um, uh, called the PACE program. Okay, yeah. so we're gonna mm -hmm. have to Cut it off there. Okay. Betty, I want to thank you very much for coming and being my guest today. It's a pleasure. And uh, folks, I think you can see this is actually a very important talk that we've been talking about. We're talking about caring for our parents or right. friends. And so uh, I would hope you, we've given you some good information as a starting point, uh, things to think of. We'll see you next time on Financial Insider Weekly. <laughs>